I'm actually one of only about 2,000 doctors in the U.S. who have specialty training in this field of obesity medicine. I use the word obesity medicine because I want people to know that obesity is actually a disease and it's not a dirty word, it's like anything else we talk about. Diabetes or heart disease, osteoarthritis, knee pain, it's the same. One of my goals in my practice and in the work I do is really to lift the stigma and the bias about weight, okay? So with that said, a quick show of hands if you're willing, and I'm gonna raise my hand, I'm already gonna tell you, who here has ever tried to lose weight and thought it was really hard? Yeah, okay? Okay, great. So <laughs> that's a good place to start. It is a very complex disease and it is very difficult to do on your own. It is not a disease that's a lack of willpower. And unfortunately, most people treat it like that. I don't know if you've ever gone to the doctor and they said, okay, well, your blood pressure's up, you just need to lose weight. And you say, how? And they say, I don't know, eat less. Well, it's tough. In the wonderful lecture before, we, we heard of why that's so hard is because our body and our hormones are actively making it very, very difficult. Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, not to, you know, focus on this too much, but 75% of our country suffers from overweight or obesity. Um, it is very, very common, and people feel very alone in this, but it really is something that affects three out of four of us. It really is an epidemic. It's a multifactorial disease. Again, it's a disease, and there are many things that go into play. So we heard about the hormones. It is genetics, it's epigenetics. Oh, quick point, the breastfeeding, the three months. What is hypothesized about breastfeeding? So if you are breastfed for longer than three months, you have lower rates of obesity, and that's kind of the epigenetics component. We think it affects the gut bacteria, and gut bacteria is, is linked to low, like healthy gut bacteria over the course of your lifetime is linked to decreased rates of obesity. Also, a child that is breastfed develops a palate for a wider range of flavors and healthier foods down the road. So, I love that. I love that little tidbit. Um, so, neurobehavioral. So, how did your brain become accustomed to eating food? Were you rewarded as a child? Did you take comfort in it? Like, it goes back, way back. Medical, so we were talking about all the medications that go into play that can lead to weight gain, all of the other diseases that can lead to weight gain. It's very complex. Your endocrine system, we were talking about insulin, insulin resistance. This is a very common problem. It's very underdiagnosed in the US too. So early insulin resistance, I think at this point, um, Three, a third of the country is pre-diabetic. So it's a reason to make it very difficult to lose weight or to gain weight, easily gain weight. Your environment, of course there's a lifestyle component, like do you have access to healthy foods? Is there a place to go run around? Can you walk? Well, what's around you? And your immune system actually, so back to gut bacteria. Um, it's something that we are starting to learn a little bit about, but we don't fully understand how everything is related within our body and why some people have a harder time and why as a country we're really getting a lot heavier. So it's something that's not just we're moving less, we're eating more, there's something bigger and we think it might have to do with immunity and maybe even exposure to viruses. Okay, so. Then, if it's so complex, what do we do about it? Do we just all give up? No. <laughs> so, really, if, it's an, if, it, if obesity is a multifactorial disease, then we should treat it in a multifactorial way. So the best way to combat weight loss is to really have a targeted plan. And this should include education, that's why we're all here, it's the mainstay, medicine. So I'm gonna talk to you about all of the tools we have in medicine today, nutrition, accountability, and CBT, which is short for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And this makes up a successful weight loss plan. And before you get overwhelmed, I'm gonna break it down and make it pretty easy. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about weight loss medications. There are other medical um, specialties that can help with weight loss, including surgery. I'm not going to cover the surgical um, approaches today. They are options for some patients. Many people uh, don't really want them. So 
it can often be a very effective tool, but it also is a big procedure. So I always think, and so do insurance companies, that we should start with uh, medical management first and lifestyle intervention. So that's where we're going to start today. So who can be considered for a weight loss medication? Anyone over a BMI of 30 or over 27 with comorbidities. So if you remember back to when you looked at the chart, that was so handy, by the way. Um, if you fall into one of these categories, ask yourself if anyone's ever talked to you about a medication. They probably haven't. We, these, we have um, six FDA-approved medications, and unfortunately, many doctors don't even really know about them. So after today, if you feel like, oh, that might help me, then go, go have a conversation with your doctor. So what is a comorbidity? That is, you have high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you have joint pains, you have back pains, you have sleep apnea. There's something else that would benefit from you losing weight. So these should never be used on their own. They're really not going to help you if you just take a pill, right? We have to be targeted. We have to remember the five-point plan that I laid out. Um, and I want people to know that a pill is not a magic wand, nor is it something that's just an easy way out. Okay? It is not something that just changes the amount of food you take in, but it's altering physiology and it's really helping with those complex hormones. So here are the drugs that are FDA approved for long-term use for the treatment of obesity. So we'll start here, I kind of listed in the most effective, the ones from the top to the bottom. So before I even get into this, because people get really scared when I bring up medications for weight loss. Like, ooh, I don't know. I once in the 80s, I heard about something bad. So, <laughs> really, and, and it's appropriately so because I feel like you need to be informed about what you know what we're using. So these are all FDA approved again for long-term use. And going back to when I said, let's think of obesity as a disease. I want you to think of it just like hypertension, right? So if you go to your doctor and your doctor says, let's try to reduce your blood pressure with lifestyle and food and we'll try all of the things. And if that doesn't work, we're going to talk about medications. And that's, actually, that's, that's absolutely how I think about these medications. And uh, I use the analogy once we're on the medication. So if we optimize your blood pressure on a medication, we stay on it for a long time, right? And no one's feeling badly about it. They're just saying, okay, that's what I need to do and now I'm at a goal. It's the same thing with weight loss medications. Is generally speaking, once we get to a goal, we will stay on the medication. It is, none of these are quick fixes. These are long-term use medications. So the top one is Qsimia. It's a very interesting drug. It combines two medications that are um, used on the market for different re reasons. One is fentramine, which is a stimulant, and the other is topiramate. That's actually a migraine medication. In combination, together, they are very effective at decreasing appetite and kind of rewiring the brain and its control centers for feedback, positive feedback with food. It's a very effective drug. The next one is actually not a pill, but if you remember back to the lecture from before, we were talking about GLP-1. This is actually a GLP-1 hormone agonist, and it's an injectable medication. It is approved for the management of obesity. A different form of this medication is also approved for um, treatment of type 2 diabetes. It is um, effective specifically for patients that are pre-diabetic, where it alters the feedback loop to the brain, and it really decreases your appetite. The next one I actually have great success with. It's called Contrave. This one I think is so fascinating because it treats uh, obesity and um, eating kind of like an addiction. So the two drugs here are naltrexone and bupropion. Naltrexone actually is, tr is used for the treatment of alcohol use. It helps people stop over drinking or stop drinking entirely. And it's the same mechanism that decreases <coughs> dopamine in the brain, it gives your brain a hit whenever you get specifically carbohydrate sugary food. And it really helps people cut back their cravings for food. And bupropion is actually the medication that's used to help people stop smoking. So, and it's also used for treatment of depression. So it's all in these chemical pathways in the brain where, you know when you're like, I really, really, really need a cookie. 
that's real <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and it's the same mechanism that's like, I really, really, really need a cigarette for people who are addicted to cigarettes. So this drug can be very effective for patients who have a lot of cravings. I always say C for cravings. Belvique um, is another uh, drug that acts on um, kind of addiction pathways in the brain and can be, very, can be effective. It's a little less effective than Qsimi and Contrave as oral agents. And then this one down at the bottom, Orlistat, don't really use it. Probably guys have heard about it. It was Ally. I think you can even get it over the counter now. Um, very bad GI side effects. So it is one of the FDA approved medications, but I don't think I've ever used it because that's just mean in my opinion. Um, the new, the new person on the block is Plenity. I have a little star by it because it's not technically a drug. It's considered an FDA approved device, but it is a pill. So it doesn't act on anything internally, physiologically. It's a hydrogel capsule that expands in your stomach. And really, it's like a plant fiber. So it fills you up. And it, it's not on the market yet, but the initial trials have actually been pretty successful. I'm a little curious as to whether it causes a lot of GI side effects and makes your belly hurt, but um, well, we shall see. So that's the new kid on the block. Okay, so who knows the answer to this? I'll, I'll hire you on the spot, come join my practice. What's the most effective way of eating, or the WOE as you often hear, for weight loss? Anyone know? That's a, good, that's a good approach. Um, the answer is it's whatever you can stick with, okay? <laughs> really. So it's the truth. So everyone's unique and individual, and there is no magical way of eating or diet. You must find something that you can stick with. Consistency is actually key here. Sustainability is key. Study after study shows this. So these are all the options, right? You probably hear uh, like headlines like, eat this, lose fat, you know, this is the miracle diet. Books top the New York seller list every January. Um, and it's one iteration of these. So we have got low calorie diets, low carb, very low carb, low fat, uh, paleo, Mediterranean, vegetarian, whole foods. And then over there, some not diet diets, intuitive eating, mindful eating, nutrient timing, intermittent fasting. It's endless, and all the studies will tell you that it really is just what you can do for the long term. So we're going to talk about how we can implement some of these. Um, I did want to touch on two trendy diets right now, and actually some things that I think are helping a lot of people, and the science is backing it up. So has anyone ever heard of a ketogenic diet? OK, so nutritional ketosis. Um, is, a, is the kind of the very scientific way to describe it. And it's Atkins was around many years ago. It's kind of an iteration of that. Um, what it can do for the right person generally, generally speaking, the person this works for has type 2 diabetes or is very insulin resistant. And by taking out refined carbohydrates and high carbohydrate counts, you can effectively lose weight because you lower your insulin level. So it's all about kind of biohacking the hormones with this one. And um, your body, instead of being fueled by carbohydrates, is fueled by its own fat and ketones. And so you're able to tap into your own stores. And this is achieved by really limiting carbohydrates, about 20 grams of total carbohydrates a day. And it can be very, very effective, as I said, for patients who have insulin resistant diseases. It, the, the safety, and the cardiologist in the corner is like, oh no. <laughs> the long term safety data on this is a little bit out. Um, but for the short term use, we know that you can drastically, for most patients, improve um, your blood sugar, your cholesterol markers, and lose a lot of weight. So as a transition, weight loss diet, it can be effective for the right person. And then intermittent fasting is another very useful tool um, that has kind of become very popular. So what is intermittent fasting? It's really just timed eating. It's just shutting down eating at a certain time. So it can be as little as 12 hours, so just eat until 8 p.m. and then do not touch any food until 8 a.m. You can go a little longer and do a 16-hour fast, where that's where you're kind of fasting through breakfast. Um, and then a 24-hour fast, uh, I, can, I find to be effective for, again, for patients who are insulin resistant once a week, 
and may, they might do it twice a week. And then there are some cases where people are fasting longer. I do not advise doing this without talking to your doctor first. Fasting doesn't actually mean not taking in anything. It just means tricking your body into not releasing any insulin. So you can still, you still and need to consume things. So water and electrolytes, broth, making sure you're getting enough salt during a fasting time, and even eating foods that will not release insulin, like a little bit of cream in your coffee can help you sustain through an intermittent fasting period. The real benefit of this is that it cuts down your choice window. It just makes it easier. You just say, I'm just not gonna, I'm just not gonna eat for, for breakfast. And so I'm not going to consume those calories or make a bad decision. It's just easy. Um, and you also really get um, decreased hormone, hunger hormones when you shut down your eating window. You have to be careful though. So some people can really find that this doesn't benefit them because then when they eat, they eat all the wrong things. So you really still have to make smart choices in the meals that you do have. Okay, so let's talk. So, so unfortunately, I didn't give you the magic bullet on the right, the best, most magical diet, but I will give you the tools you need to use when you do pick a diet that you think sounds sustainable for you. Food journaling. So writing down everything you eat and being consistent about it is probably the number one tool that you can implement to lose weight. It is shown over and over again that patients who write down their food and don't lie <laughs> or, or you know write down everything and really write it down without judgment and just say oh okay I had a donut oh okay those patients all lose a lot more weight than patients who don't the other thing that this is very important for is weight maintenance so patients who keep off a significant amount of weight for more than one year one of the things that they do is write everything down it really doesn't take up much time. You can keep it on your phone, on a note section, or a piece of paper. And what I want you to do is write down when, what, and why. Like, were you tired? Were you actually hungry? Were you emotional? Were you bored? I think the bringing in the why is pretty important. Um, you don't have to count calories for this to work. You don't have to think about anything. Just write what you ate down. And then the other trick is actually meal planning. So if you can sit down once a week Take out a calendar, this is not meal prepping, so I'm not saying chop up everything, make your you know, feast, just meal planning. If you can write down what you think your next seven days are going to look like, what might get in your way, what events you might have, and what you want to eat, it's a really powerful. If you think about it, if you take five minutes to write down what you'll eat over the next seven days, you have eliminated 21 chances in the next seven days to make a bad decision and to feel really fatigued by what to eat. So this is a great tool and I make my, my patients practice this. So one thing to also think about when you're food journaling is, are you actually hungry? So a lot of us eat, not because we're hungry, but because it's time to eat. It's a social occasion. We're bored, we're sad, we're happy, we're stressed. It just happens to be there. So thinking about whether or not we're hungry when we log can be very useful. I want everyone to stay between three and five. I don't know why six, some of my formatting was a little off. Just read three to five. So you start to eat when you're pretty hungry. Your stomach is growling, you're thinking about food a lot, and really it's, it's time. And then you, as you're eating, you're appreciating it, and you're, you're, you start to feel satisfied. Now, you're not overly stuffed, and you don't feel like, oh, why did I do that? That's, it's tough lines. You have to take some time as you're eating and really keep checking back in. But it's remarkable, once you start logging your food and ask yourself, where do I fall on the hunger scale, you'll often find that you're eating not because you're hungry. And that's a really great place to start. So the final thing to talk about here is your mind. So I asked at the beginning who in the room had tried to lose weight and what, how hard it was, and most of us raised our hands. With all of those weight loss attempts and perhaps bad interactions with doctors or negative comments from family members about our weight, a lot of us are carrying around a lifetime of negative emotions about weight loss in our bodies. 
And we need to recognize those feelings as we start a new process of health. And one of the things that we can do is use these elements of cognitive behavioral therapy as we go along in a weight loss and weight maintenance period to really work through, first identify triggers, identify negative thoughts, and then try to rework those negative thoughts. So cognitive behavioral therapy says that everything kind of comes down to this. There is a circumstance, you have a thought, your brain creates a sentence about that circumstance. Your body then has like a vibration, a feeling of an emotion, and that emotion will then lead you to an action. So in a weight loss journey, something that's a circumstance is you're really, really, really trying to lose weight, and uh, you say, I'm not gonna have any sweets today, and then you go to a party and there's a fresh baked tray of cookies, right? That's the circumstance. And your thought is, oh, but I said I wasn't going to have a cookie, but they're right there and I should have them. And then your emotion is, oh, I knew I could never lose weight. Like I knew I couldn't set this goal and I feel really crummy about this. And then your action is you eat a cookie, right? So what we'll do, and I'll have my patients write these emotions down. Now it's kind of a silly example. It can get a little bit deeper than that. Um, but what we'll do is the circumstances, the cookies, and the thought will restructure, not like, oh, I'm gonna fail, I'm just going to give in, I know it, I know it. It's more, okay, I set a goal, and I, I accomplish goals all the time, I'm not going to have a cookie. And then your emotion is one of positive reinforcement, and then your action is you didn't have a cookie. Now, am I saying you can never have a cookie? No. <laughs> but, you know, when we constantly sabotage ourselves in a weight loss process, when we always have this idea that the diet will start tomorrow, you just get very depleted, right? So I'm always encouraging people to take back these negative behaviors and these repeated behaviors of, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, no, okay, just this one. Because it starts to really eat into your will to really do this. So we, when we make a commitment, I have people write down all of their, their triggers and their negative thoughts, and we really work through the journaling too. So. You know, we have the medications and we have surgery, but you have to work on your mind. I actually had a mentor who's a surgeon and said, you know, I can cut out part of your stomach, but I can't cut out, cut out part of your brain. So we have to remember that no matter what kind of tools, medical tools we have at our disposal, we also really have to work on what's going on in our brain because there is a big connection between our brain and our gut. Okay, and I think that is it.